Welcome to this week's Into the Wilderness podcast in conjunction with our partner, ModernHuntsman.com. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 14th of May, 2020. A slight change of plan with this show. I was originally going to be bringing you a chat with filmmaker Ryan Youngblood, which is going to be coming out in two weeks' time. But having just returned from the States, I was feeling a little nostalgic. So I thought I'd bring you this interview with Connor Knighton, who has just released a book called Leave Only Footprints my Acadia to Zion journey through every national park. It chronicles his journey of discovery through the national parks of North America. After learning about his background in TV and what drew him into undertaking this book, we dig into the origins of the national parks, John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt. We talk about bison hunting caribou, the rare pupfish, the recovery of the Channel Island fox populations, and speculate as to why people move to Alaska. For me, it was a massively entertaining conversation, and I would encourage anyone who has an interest in the outdoors to get a copy of Connor's book, Leave No Trace. A few things before we jump into the show. First of all, a big shout out to our top tier Patreons, which this week include Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Chris Griffith, John Henry Pete, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, the guys at South Ash Stalking, Josh Starling, Sean Rowan, James Eldon Corbin and Thomas Cameron. If you want to support us, head over to Patreon forward slash Pace Brothers, uh, or you can just show us a bit of love by giving the show a rating or a review. All are massively appreciated. We have a winner from our competition two weeks ago, which was open to everyone who supports us on Patreon. And it was, of course, to win a copy of Modern Huntsman, whichever volume you choose. And randomly selected from our list of Patreon supporters is Connor Brown. So congratulations, Connor. Contact us either through Patreon or through the usual um, social network channels, and I will get a copy out to you. We have a new competition to win a copy of Modern Huntsman, and you will be able to once again pick whichever issue you want, one through to four, or if you want to wait a month or so, you could also decide that you want to get your hands on volume five, which we are just putting into design right now, and it is all on traditions around the world. So all you have to do to be in with the chance is to share this podcast on some sort of social platform, whether that be an Instagram story, a Facebook story on your Facebook wall, or on Twitter, wherever you like, just make sure that you tag me so that I know that you've shared. On Twitter and Instagram, I am at Byron J. Pace. And if you want to tag on Facebook, it's at Pace Brothers Phil. Or if you are not into the whole social networking thing, that is absolutely okay. Just send me an email, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com, and uh, tell me that you want to enter. And uh, maybe even like, let me know which has been your favorite episode recently. That would be cool to know. Last thing. Don't forget, the Northern Shooting Show, which would have been going on right about now, has been moved due to uh, the whole coronavirus deal that we're all having to put up with at the moment. Uh, And that is on the 28th and 29th of August, 2020. Visit northernshootingshow.co.uk for more information. Okay, I think that's it. I won't hold you up anymore. Here is Connor Knight. Connor, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Awesome to have you on today. What part of North America are you in? Because I, I know under normal circumstances, you're very much the nomad, or you have been in recent years. Yeah, so it took a pandemic to get me to stay in one place. <laughs> um, uh, I have not had a permanent address since uh, the end of 2015. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in a second. But in, in yeah. 2016, when I went to all the national parks, it really just didn't make any sense to keep a place during that time. Um, I would have never seen it. Um, and I needed the money. So I, I took the money that I had been spending for rent in Los Angeles and used that to, to you know, stay in cabins and campsites all across the country. And then I just kind of never re-entered society after that. <laughs> for, for years, I have continued to live on the road. Um, it's stretched far longer than I thought it would. Um, but when all of the coronavirus stuff started to look like it was getting pretty serious. I was in Nashville um, shooting a story for CBS Sunday Morning, um, a story about like a, a cable network for cowboys, a very, a very unrelated um, story to, uh, to to what's now the, the news that everyone's talking about. But 
when the hotel shut down the breakfast buffet, like it, it started to look like you a, knew shit was going down. I, exactly. In my world, they, they take sauce. away those processed scrambled eggs, and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I gotta get someplace. So, so I fled back to LA because um, I thought a town that I know with good weather and a CBS bureau is probably yeah. a good place to be based. And, and I've been right on that. I've been able to do a couple of stories since I've been out here, but it's a weird time for news. Uh, I mean, obviously it's a weird time for everyone, but my beat has so often been travel related stories. It's weird not to be able to travel at all. So I've done some stuff in Southern California, but mostly stay and put in a little cottage I found uh, on Airbnb, which sadly there are many of right now. I mean, no one's renting Airbnb. So it's, no. it's kind of a good time to find a deal uh, on that front mm. in a uh, studio city, which is just North of LA. Cool. It's a really weird thing for me because I travel a lot as well, with mostly with work, but some of that's just for fun. And it's not so much that it's not so much the inability to go places, but it's the inability um, to have the freedom to go places. Because normally, if I just if I want to go somewhere to see someone, or I want to go and uh, start some project that I've been imagining for for months I just do it I, I book a flight I jump in my car I go and right now none of that is possible yeah well and also like the priorities have shifted for those trips or even for where to stay so as like as I looked at where to rent a spot and, and I may move again next month depending on how long this continues but like a lot of the pluses which are like cool neighborhood near my friends near fun stuff to do cool restaurants none of those matter so i'm honestly thinking of going to irvine a town i don't even know if i've ever been to just sort of a Where, where's irvine it's a kind of a boring suburb in orange county um so so, so <laughs> close still close enough i could get back to la stuff but it has google fiber internet and wide streets to walk around mm-hmm. and those are my new like two biggest priorities <laughs> yeah um, a so huge it, shift isn't it yeah, yeah, it's it's very very different, and I and I'm lucky to you know like the, the checks are still coming. You know, I, I could be in a much worse situation, but it is still a little anxiety inducing to just be like stuck at home but not quite have a home. So I, I'm in a place now that's perfectly fine, but it doesn't feel cozy or familiar at all because it's it's someone else's house that I'm I'm temporarily renting. So I want to get into the backstory of how this all came about, but I, I think a, a little bit of groundwork before we get into your book, uh, Leave Only Footprints, which is was the catalyst. This this landed in the house here, and I, I picked this up and started flicking through. I was like, I think I need to speak to this guy because it's really fascinating. <laughs> I, I mean, I've consumed so much of the book in a really rapid space of time. Well, that's great. Good, good, good for quarantine. I feel like day. that's a slight advantage to release. It, mostly, it's a negative to release a bookstore when or a book when yeah. all bookstores are closed. But right now, people do have more time to read, so I'm happy about that. Uh, honestly, that is not the reason I was reading the book. It wasn't because I had nothing else. To do. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, so but bef- before we get to that, what is your what was you, uh, prior to uh, and I want to talk a little bit uh, about the, the the catalyst of um, breakdown in, in relationships and this thread that you run throughout the book because it's not something that we normally talk about on this podcast, but it's it's it was really interesting the way that you wove this into the the story of your exploration of the national parks in North America. But uh, yeah, before we get to that, what was your sort of day to day job? You, you were involved in in TV prior to this book coming to uh, being in your mind. Yeah. So um, at the time, uh, well, immediately before the book, I was you know, very much like temporarily to unemployed. You know, that that's how TV works is that I've had some great gigs and then I've had no gigs for, for months. And, and that's the the either the like the addiction you keep coming back to that that is exciting or it's what forces people to kind of shift industries. Um, I'd started at Current TV, which is a cable network that doesn't exist anymore. Um, It was uh, co-founded by Al Gore. Uh, It was sort of an MTV meets CNN, uh, a lot of user-generated content, uh, in a lot of ways ahead of its time. YouTube, ultimately, which launched a little bit after Current, sort of supplanted that, where like if you had a cool video of something, whether it was a flash flood or a protest in your town, those ultimately went to YouTube. I think the hope was that those would have gone to Current. Um, Uh, I did like a, a news comedy show for them that was... If I'm flattering myself in the vein of something like uh, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, that's a better show. I love Last <laughs> we Week were, Tonight. Yeah. <laughs> we're in that genre of like funny, but like still with the point, trying to be smart. 
Um, I, I wish we had something like last week tonight in the UK because I've been watching it well when I've been in uh, the States like in the last six to eight months. And it's a freaking brilliant show. It's great. And I mean, and I think yeah. what, what I appreciated a lot uh, about it a lot is that they do their homework. Like, and, yeah, it's and, very funny, but it's very smart. And you feel like you've learned something. And I feel like when there's so many demands on, on our attention, um, if you can be entertained and also come away a little bit smarter at the end of it uh, about, yeah. I mean, about all kinds of, they've taught me about like how the U.S. territories work and like how, you know, certain, you know, bills and all kinds of stuff. So, so we did a bit of that. I mean, we were, we were cool. worse, but, but of that same time. <laughs> um, and so I was there for years. I've done a bunch of other odds and ends that like um, everything from like hosting a clip show on amc to a finance segment that you know broadcast out of a station in phoenix just a, a whole gamut of, of tv related stuff and then cbs mm-hmm. sunday morning the show i work for now at the time of the journey that uh the book documents i was only a contributor for them so sunday morning okay. has been on in the u.s for 41 years at this point um it's wow long running show long running show i mean it's and we've got some people who have been on it for almost that long. It's the kind of job that, like, once you get, you stay at, um, which is why there's so much competition to to become a member of that team. And so, so, so they, what what is that that for? Uh, we have a lot of uh, listeners, and in fact, most of our listeners are in North America, so they'll probably know the show anyway. But for everyone else in the rest of the world, what what does the show entail? Yeah, so it's a magazine format show. It's an hour and a half every Sunday. Um, it is. Uh, there, there is a host in New York. Um, that host is now Jane Polly. For years before that, it was Charles Osgood. And before that, it was Charles Kuralt. So really only three hosts in the show's, you know, four decade history. Um, and from this studio in New York, they're throwing to a series of correspondence, of which I am now one, um, to do stories about, I mean, everything you might find in the Sunday newspaper, um, but with more of a focus on like the arts and culture section than uh than what like a Monday through Friday newscast might do. So Monday through Friday, if you watch CBS in the mornings, that that show will be very much about what is happening that day. Who said what? Is there a forest fire? Like what's Congress doing? On Sunday morning, we slow things down a little bit and we might do five minutes on a guy who has a collection of washing machines in India. <laughs> you know, if he's interesting enough, like, and, and I think that's why people come to us. You're not coming to us to find like, like what just happened. It's, it's long, so like quirky it's, stories. Quir- I mean, some of it's quirky. I mean, we'll do something, you know, uh, with, with some heft to it, but normally those are, are more investigative, longer kind of, of, uh, of pieces. So I've got stories now that I shot, three months ago that'll air three months from now. And that's fairly oh, right, difficult okay. for our show. So um, while that can sometimes be frustrating because you want it to air, um, yeah. it, it's always really beautiful. Um, it just in turn, we have more time to edit it. We're not crashing anything rarely, um, but it's every, I mean, I've done pieces from um, like the Danish obsession with salty black licorice and a, and a man who was convinced that he could yep. make the rest of the, it's so gross, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but there's this, there's this Danish guy who's like trying to turn it into a luxury good. And he's trying to convince, he, he sees America as a potential massive market for him. If only he can convince, oh. convince us to eat this. Liquor. There are a few stuff. sweets. If you can even call it a sweet. That That's, I, like, yeah, I debate the sweet. That. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's uh, he what he's done, and it's it's pretty clever. Is first of all like cool font, high price, small batch, and then also um, coated in chocolate or other flavors that we might. Eat. Okay, yeah, coated in something that tastes decent. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it could be something you know from that to like a piece in uh, Saint Helena, um, a, a British territory, but like you know miles and miles away from from the rest of the UK, way in the middle of the ocean. Um, yeah. and then a new airport that they opened up there, um, which instead of a six week round trip boat ride was all of a sudden a, a twice a week flight, um, could be a story mm. that I've done. So, so all, all over the map. So, re- the map. so a really broad spectrum of topics. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. So what was the, um, so at, at the time where prior to you taking this amazing journey to visit the national parks in North America, you weren't full time. Uh, and and is that what enabled you to have the ability to do this? To tell me that story, because the catalyst from reading your book was the breakdown of, uh, of a relationship. 
Yeah. So I, um, for a couple of years, had gone to uh, Phoenix, Arizona to host a show that um, even your North American listeners will have never uh, seen or heard of this show. <laughs> Although it does, I mean, maybe it depends on what town they live in. It was a very weird model of a show. It still exists. It's called The List. Um, and it airs like in certain towns across the country, but not all of them. So like, for all I know, I'm famous in Tampa and Cincinnati. <laughs> like this, this show does not air in Los Angeles, but it was like, it was an evening, like pop culture news magazine. I did some finance pieces for them. Um, and for cost reasons, they based it out of Phoenix. So for a couple of years, I was living there at some point, you know, I, I didn't know anybody in Phoenix. I, I go on the internet, do a little bit of online dating, actually only go on one date, uh, the, uh, or a date with one person, um, the woman I would propose to two years after that. So she was also visiting Phoenix. She was on a, an extended work assignment as well. Um, and so at some point we moved together to, uh, to LA, we got engaged. And then, um, the week that the save the dates came in the mail, uh, was the week that she, uh, or, or that we had just gotten like the proofs back from those, um, was the week that she called everything off. Um, I, I blindsided, didn't see it coming. And, and as I talked about earlier, you know, TV is this world where like, your future is very hard to visualize. And I've long ago made my peace with the fact that like, work wise, I won't know what's coming up. But for this moment, I thought I knew exactly what my future held, yeah. at least the, the most important part of it. Um, and then it was, it was very jarring to have that taken away all of a sudden. And so, you know, I did what a lot of people would do in that situation. I it kind of feels like what I'm doing right now, which is I just sat around the house. You know, <laughs> I did not leave. I, I, it was a self-imposed, self-quarantine, just kind of uh, hung out. To the point where at some point my friends were like, dude, you know, like this, this is, you need to do so something bad for you. You got to do something, you know, change yeah. the scenery might do you good. I, 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 I when I, when I got good? to that bit in the book, I, I, I was sitting on a roof deck here in LA and I got to that part of the book and I, I'm, ex I was expecting it to like, I don't know, start in the heart of one of the national parks for, mm -hmm. or, for obvious reasons with the, the title of the book. And I get through like page 14. I was like, this is really fucking sad. <laughs> I, I, I can feel a tear coming from my eye here. <laughs> it's not all sad. It's not all sad. Well, you know, and, and I debated whether or not to even include that in the book. Because you can certainly write a story about the parks that doesn't include that personal aspect of it. Um, but, and, and there was a, a draft I wrote that didn't have that in there. But, like, it was ultimately the truth of what had happened. And so, um it to, to not, I'm generally a pretty private person and, and you still don't learn too much about what happened there, but like, like to not include it at all felt, uh, like a pretty glaring omission. Um, and so, uh, it really, it was the, the impetus for this. Um, uh, I think gosh, I, I would have been the world's worst fiance if I was still engaged and then went to go see every <laughs> national park. <laughs> I was just like, all right, I'll see you later. I'll send you a I think this I think this continued sort of personal thread that runs through the book adds a dimension that I hadn't seen before in this kind of topic. So I'm really glad that you decided to include it and did not take it out. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Um, it's it's a balance, obviously, of, of you know, of figuring out how, how much of, of me to include as the chapters go on, some have, have more uh, or less. But But at the time when I was... You know, back in 2015, when I was sitting around moping, I'd seen an article that the next year was going to be the centennial of the National Park Service. And I had thought, well, that's a thing that, you know, Sunday morning, the show that at the time I kind of worked for, like they might do a story on that. Like it, it certainly seems like a thing our audience might like. And then partially because I had too much time on my hands, like just before I sent that email, I, I just kind of had this flash and deleted it and out instead sent an email that outlined what if we did a whole year's worth of stories. Like these parks must have the kinds of stories that we air on Sunday morning generally, stories of food and family and art and architecture. And so it was an outlandish, looking back on it, it was an extremely outlandish pitch because like they did not employ me. Um, and here I have this pinch hitter that they occasionally use being like, I know you should commit to me for a year. We're going to do all these stories. But yeah. amazingly, they they ultimately said yes. Um, although I would have done this whether they said yes or not. At some point, once I got the idea into my head, I was like, "All right, I'm doing it." So I was selling my stuff. I gave my 30 days notice. Um, I planned wow. a trip to Acadia, my first park, before they said yes or not, knowing that 
I would find something. I'd clean campsites. I'd find a way to like work. You just make it. it happen. And you needed would, it at the time. I needed it. Something yeah. Like, it. like it just, I needed to get out of that apartment for sure. Like that, that needed to happen. Um, because there were memories there because it was kind of like too expensive for a guy who wasn't working that much at the time, you know? And so, uh, I, I, that had to happen. This seemed like a, a fun way, even if I had to bail three months into it, you know, I thought, let me at least just give this a shot. Um, and so when they ultimately said yes, they smartly, I think, decided not to do a piece on every park. And honestly, there wouldn't have been enough weeks in the year to even do that. Yeah, because that would have taken a long time. Yeah, so long. And, well, and also, like, like uh, viewer fatigue might have set in. I mean, there was something nice about it being an ongoing series, but also, like, you got a break from it. There'd be a couple of weeks without yeah. a story, and then we'd put one on. But I just decided, you know what, if I'm going to go to, let's say, a third of the parks for work... I might as well just go all in. Like you, you don't want to be the guy who traveled to like half the parks, right? What a boring <laughs> conversation that is. Yeah. Oh, I went to half the parks. Who cares? I, oh, I guarantee you would not be having this conversation. You. Yeah. If I'd been going to half the parks, but uh, all the parks, all of a sudden you're like, all right, let's talk to this guy. So um, <laughs> for that, for that reason alone, it seemed worth doing. And also just like, like if I'm going to Alaska where there's eight parks and doing three for the show, like I'm going to stick around and, and hit those other ones. And so that's, Damn right. that's what I took the money that I had been using to, you know, pay for my life in LA to supplement. I mean, I was getting paid some for work, but I would, I would supplement the, the off times with that. So. Cool. So how did, how did you decide which parks you were going to do first and in what order? Because they are scattered right across North America. I mean, from like Alaska down to the tip of the Everglades. Yeah. So the, if I was just hitting them all for fun and there are people who have done, you know, a version of this journey before, I'm not the only person to hit them all. And certainly not even the only person to hit them all in a year. Um, but there's a, there's a much more logical way you do it. If you were just trying to tap your toe in each one of them, um, I, and even that's still kind of challenging to plan because there's some of them that are inaccessible for parts of the year. Um, you, you know, you have to schedule and seaplane flights to get to some of them. But I had this added element of not just chasing weather, but chasing stories. And so it would turn out that like the scientist that I wanted to interview at Glacier National Park, he was available for one week in July. So it's like, okay, well, that's when I've got to go there if that's the story I want to tell. Um, or I interviewed the Secretary of Interior while well, she's at Mount Rainier in Washington State. Uh, yeah, it's like some early week in June, and it just happened to be a, a week difference from the story I wanted to tell in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. So there was lots of backtracking and zigzagging. If I ever made a map of what that trip looked like, it would just look chaotic um, because it was. But then even there, I had some decisions in terms of which parks do I do for the show. Now, in the book, I talk about all of them. But since we were only doing certain ones for the broadcast, when the year began, I thought, well, OK, for sure I'm doing Yosemite. For sure I'm doing Yellowstone. Um, I ended up not doing either of those for the show. And I, it's because I think my focus very quickly shifted and my curiosity shifted into these parks that I'd never heard of. All of a sudden, when you look yeah. on the list, you're like... I haven't heard a third of these. And like, yeah. that's an interesting starting point for any story. If you turn on the broadcast and it's like, Hey, we're at great sand dunes national park. If, I don't know if anything else. That? About it. Right, exactly. If that's your first thought, like, <laughs> everyone right now, knows like, where Yellowstone is. Everyone knows. Yeah. Where the, um, I mean, most people will pro probably heard of Sequoia as well, but I mean, there's so many of these national parks. I was like, I can't believe I didn't know the names of the, so many of these same and, and so that that reaction to me was i felt like there would be other folks in that camp and so I, I started to gravitate more toward those for the broadcast and then kind of pieced out the ones that i just wanted to hit for fun um on my own although what i ultimately found was that i could have done a story in all of these for the show and that's kind of how the book came about i wasn't trying to write a book as this year was happening but when I would go to these parks that I was just going to on my own, I was like, well, wow, that's, that story is just as interesting as the one I told at Great Sand Dunes. And maybe there's a way to tell all these, you know, uh, in total. The title of your book, Leave Only Footprints, is, it, that's three words that a lot of people will have heard, although they maybe not, uh, they maybe won't know how or where that was attributed to. Uh, and I'm actually not even quite sure I know where that came from. Was that a Teddy Roosevelt thing or was that a quote from something he wrote? 
You know, it's more of just like a quote you're going to see at a campground. In terms of a specific yeah. person, I mean, I've seen it attributed to a, a, a tribal chief before. I, I don't think any of that's – I think a lot of people have said it. I think the origin of that is yeah. just one of those like, you know, who knows, golden rule kind of do unto others uh, type quote. Got you. Um, but, but generally you see it. Um, and there's kind of, there's two versions of that quote. There's, um, or that saying there's leave no trace. Um, and that's sort of this you know, set of wilderness ethics of, you know, um, or leave it better than you found it. Um, but leave only footprints to me is a little bit more honest than leave no trace. Cause I found that wherever I went, I always saw traces of past people. I mean, the sentiment of leave only trace, leave no trace I get, which is pick up your trash, but like, like the, the traces of past visitors or past decision makers. I mean, the parks is, is that they are a legacy of of decisions that were made before my time, and while I was in them, I was seeing how decisions being made in my time were playing out. And so, the idea of footprints felt a little bit more like what my experience was, which was, you know, at our best, we're leaving a light touch, but still a path that like shows the way forward and maybe a way to find our way back. Hmm. Yeah, no, I can, I can appreciate that for sure. I, I'm just, I was just thinking to myself while you were talking there that m- maybe we should backtrack just a little hmm. and talk about how the national parks came to being not a deep dive into the history, but just an overview because they're held so close to the hearts of almost every American I've ever met and they are so well known around the world, and the the model of national parks here have been replicated to a greater or lesser extent in many other parts of the world. I love the national parks here, and I'm not even an American. So where yeah. where what was the what facilitated this evolution of parks? Well, you have a, a one of your Scottish countrymen to, to thank for it in a lot of ways, um, John, John Muir. Muir. Yeah, who lived yeah. in Scotland until he was twelve. Um, I think a lot of Americans don't know that he's Scottish because he's so. They've claimed him, right? Yeah, <laughs> because and, and, and the bulk of what he did was was you know in America. Sure. Um, but like, um, their uh, yeah, his origin was in I think Dunbar. I think is where he's from. Or I, I actually don't, I'm not quite sure, but that um, Dunbar is a place, so quite possibly. Okay, all right. <laughs> if that popped into my head, I think that's right. Uh, or he, that's either where he left for the U.S. or where he was born. Um, but uh, he, um, I, I mean, it was it was an idea that it's tough to attribute to one person, um, but it was this kind of confluence of factors where, like, in Europe, most of the most beautiful places were private. Kings had them. You know, it was it was um, you know Versailles belonged to someone, um, whereas you know the U.S. Um, uh, there wasn't private ownership of a lot of public beauty. Now, obviously there were people, I mean, you know, the, the, the story of almost every park is, is not a happy story for native Americans, you know, although that's also the story of Manhattan and Cincinnati, you know, I mean, that's, that is a, a shame that exists across the whole country, but there were not private people like with estates on a lot of these places. And so America kind of had a chance to do things differently. And so, um, and also there was just like, like the natural beauty and I'm sure I'm biased, but like there is no tree in the world as large as a sequoia. It is the largest tree anywhere. And so, you know, when, when folks got to California and saw them, there was just this wow moment of like, okay, well, we've got to protect this thing, you know, because it's so unlike anything else. Actually, they stripped the bark of some of them, sent them back to the UK to like brag about how awesome America was. It's like, all right, I think that we're a bunch of hillbillies out here, but like, look at these trees we got. Um, and, and I believe the British folks at the time did not believe that they were real. They thought it was some like circus kind of, uh, or like sideshow attraction. That we Interesting. Um, but anyway, so the, the parks, I mean, Yellowstone was the, uh, the world's first national park um, uh, in the late 1800s. Um, although hot springs, which is now a national park was protected even before that under a different designation, but what, what started to happen, Yosemite was actually protected before Yellowstone, but as a state park. So there was this, this piecemeal of collection of public use lands that were starting to pop up. And so my year took place during the centennial of the park service. So it took until 1916 where there were already a dozen or so national parks for them to realize, all right, there should be an, an organization who is in charge of these for a while, like the army would patrol them. It was, it, you know, the, 
the idea, and this often happens in government, where like, like you know, an idea happens, but the follow through doesn't. That was happening with the parks where it's like, okay, we, we wrote a bill, we've protected Yellowstone, now what the heck's going to happen to it? And so um, in 1916, the Park Service, which we know today, was developed and then they've, they've continued to manage that land ever since, which is a part of the mm, Department yeah. of Interior. Yeah, that was a, there was that a period of time where there was this sort of a, epiphany and, and realization of the damage that man had done, particularly here in North America, with the decimation of of bison and and landscapes so far removed from how they were when uh, European settlers first got there. Yeah, and I mean, I know you you touch on hunting topics a lot, and it's it's a you know one of the most famous hunters we've ever had. Um, is responsible for for a lot of the the parks as we know them today. So Teddy Roosevelt, whose whose first instinct when he saw a bison was to kill it. I mean, that's why he went to North Dakota uh, or to, yep. at that time it was just the Dakota Territory. He's like, I got I got to get one of these things. Um, but then very soon after that, did he realize, okay, like like the experience of seeing like these should not be wiped off the face of the country. You know, other people should have this experience to see them or to hunt them. Um, but something has to be done if we want to want either of those things to continue forward at the time, I think there were 300 or so left. Um, and so, uh, that, you know, conservationist, uh, you know, impulse, um, was, was very strong in him. He protected, many parks, um, many, uh, monuments that then turned into parks. Um, uh, there's a, a group of elk at Olympic national park in Washington that are named the Roosevelt elk. In the Roosevelt honor. elk. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you were going to like, it, it's not any single person's idea or doing, but if you were going to make like a greatest hits of, of the park service, certainly Teddy, I mean, John Muir for a private citizen and then for like a government official, Teddy Roosevelt for sure um, had, had a, a ton to do with, with why the parks are, are around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He has this great quote, which I won't remember quite correctly. Um, talking about his time in search of bison about how when he realized that he had to do something i think he he had rode for a day on horseback and he was never within sight of a live one or out of sight of a dead one mm. uh, and that mm. was the kind of moment that he realized shit yeah. we've got to do something here and yeah thank goodness he did i mean that's like the, the parks are often I mean, although you could argue that's sort of in his self-interest um in that like uh, yeah of course yeah. yeah but like mostly there's stories of people acting you know, outside of their immediate self-interest. Going to back to your your trip and your journey around, uh, we, we can't touch on every park that you spent time in. But are there are there a couple of experiences that were you know truly stand out? Um, whether that be just because they were so fascinating, or because they personally touched you in, in this journey that you were taking to sort of uh, rediscover yourself. Yeah, I think in a way that's easier to answer than favorite park. A lot of people ask favorite park, and and it's just uh, like, favorite park. I, yeah, that's a stupid question. Uh, why? Because how do you compare them? They're just so yeah. different. Like like um, yeah, I, I feel like favorite food is just as hard. Like, like pizza is just very different than sushi, and I like them both. <laughs> and, I think it's okay. and sometimes, <laughs> depending yeah. on the circumstances, pizza's best. Right, exactly. And some furniture yeah. in a sushi movie. So who knows? So in this case, like, but it's maybe it's maybe easier to say what's your favorite pizza place. Um, and yeah. so favorite experience is a little easier for me for me to answer. Um, one that the first one that popped into my head was uh, at Volcanoes National Park in Hawaii. Um, seeing the lava, um, I was there as Kilauea was erupting, and they let you get unsafely close to it. I mean, you just sort of, you, you have to walk for a while, but eventually you're, you're there, you step to the left accidentally and you're, you're in the lava. Um, and that was, un, it stands out because it was so different than anything else I saw in the parks. Um, as, as scenically diverse as they all are, at some point you're just like, okay, that's a cool mountain, that's a cool mountain. But there's lots with cool mountains. There's lots with beautiful lakes. There aren't any others with lava. Um, and so- that and even that park actually right now uh would be a different experience than the one i had that volcano is not uh actively uh flowing in the same place that it used to and so um i would not even be able to replicate that experience now which is also maybe why it stood out to me that it just felt like i got really lucky it was the right moment in time um and just a super i mean it was mother nature giving birth 
Like when else do you get mm. to see that? Um, and, and I had never seen that anywhere else before. So I've never that seen was, that. I'd love to. I, it must be yeah. phenomenal. I've never. I've actually. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever been close to an active volcano. I've, I've seen a lot of geothermal stuff, but never an active volcano. Yeah, and I mean, it's like there's a way. That, the probably the easiest way to see it at that park or back then it was, was like, there's a rim by like the USGS, like observatory, there's a, a platform and you can look into it. And that is honestly cool enough. If you went back to your hotel at the, at the coast after that, you would have had a good day, but it was so different to be able to walk out and, and feel it and be near it. Um, and I liked it so much. Then the next night I got a, a, a boat ride. Like I hired these guys to take me out on a boat so you could see it pour into the water. And that was like, I mean, you'd reach your hand into the ocean and it would feel hot like a jacuzzi because, you know, uh, feet away from you, um, the, the hmm. water's pouring in. So it was great. I mean, wow. it's also just like you, you, every Island in Hawaii, Honolulu, you know, when you're in the city of Honolulu, it was also created by a volcano. You just don't think about it. Um, and so being there and seeing that new land at the point, the newest land in the country, being formed right in front of your eyes was really special. So that that one continues to stand out for me when I when I think back throughout the year. There was one part which I haven't actually got to because I was kind of cherry picking bits of the book. I didn't have time to finish it before you and I are having this conversation. Uh, so maybe you can you can enlighten me as into your time in Alaska with um, I think you did you went on a caribou hunt. Um, yeah. So uh, Alaska to me was like the big discovery of the year. It is. Uh, especially having I'm desperate to go there. Yeah. Well, and like, like if I said I was going to New York for, for even a weekend, people in LA wouldn't bat an eye. It's like, okay, yeah, big whoop. But if I said I was going to Alaska, it sounds exotic and, and remote. It is the same. New frontiers. Yeah. But it's LA to Anchorage is basically the same money, the same time as LA to Manhattan uh, on a plane. And I don't know why it just was never on my radar before, but now I'm determined I've been back once, even since the year in the book, I'm determined to go back a lot because it's very doable from the West coast and, and uh, amazing. Um, And so uh, Alaska has eight parks. Denali is the most uh, popular by far of those. Um, Kenai Fjords is also relatively accessible um, from Anchorage. You drive a little further south and and there's glaciers and a boat ride you can take down there. Um, But two of the least visited parks in the entire country um, are in Alaska, Kobuk Valley and Gates of the Arctic National Park. Um, there are no trails, there are no roads, they are completely disconnected from the rest of Alaska. You have to take a plane, um, into, into either, uh, or potentially in the winter, you could take like a snowmobile there. Um, but they, they are remote. And so Alaska is very different than the rest of the U S national parks. So the parks as a rule do not allow hunting. I wanted to press pause on Connor for a moment because it's something I felt that I should have really known more about. He is right. In most parks, there is no hunting, but there are some exceptions. As I dug about for information on hunting in national parks, I first came across this on the National Parks Service website. Hunting can instill an appreciation of wildlife, land, and nature. It's a tradition passed from generation to generation as family and friends take to the woods, fields, and waters. Hunters contribute billions of dollars to conservation through revenues from licenses, federal duck stamps, and excise taxes on hunting equipment and ammunition. The National Park Service units permit hunting. Staff work with state governments to manage and conserve game species and enhance the safety of hunters and non-hunters. As I looked a little bit more, Zion National Park website offered some myth debunking on various topics, and that included the myth that there is no hunting occurring in national parks. In fact, in one third of parks, some form of managed hunting takes place, and they list off the notable examples, including uh, the Lake Roosevelt National Recreation Area and the Grand Teton National Park, to name just two. The links to these two websites will be in the show notes. Okay, back to Connor. Um, But when Alaska created their national parks in the 80s, um, they realized they'd have to do it a little differently, because the, there are communities that continue to live within the parks. So um, while there are no, there's no visitor center or trails or anything like that at Gates of the Arctic, um, there is a community, Anaktuvik Pass population, I don't know, 280, maybe 320, um, who moved to that land, uh, uh, Native Inupiat people in Alaska, long before this was a, a park, and they moved there for the caribou. They Their ancestors have been following the caribou migration patterns 
um, for years. And so to tell them that, that they can't hunt, that is shutting down a major food supply for them. Um, it's, it just, it just couldn't have been done otherwise. They, they would have been too controversial in Alaska. I don't think the parks would have ever happened. Um, and so, so they allow hunting in the national parks. If you are a native or no, not native, just a, a rural resident. So sure. if you went there as a tourist, you would not be allowed to hunt. If you decided to uproot your life and move there, yeah, go for it. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have to, to live in and around those parks. Um, and then there's some rules about what you can, you know, how many you can harvest or whatever. But like, yeah, um, I mean, it was, it was fascinating. And I think, I think it opened, it opened my eyes. I, that, that was a story we aired on the show. And I think. It, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so so you can actually watch a, a piece on that, and, and it, it's fascinating. I mean, the scenery is amazing, but I think like I, I met these two young guys. Um, one in particular is, is my presidential nominee for like twenty forty two or whenever he's old enough <laughs> to be president because he's a sixteen year old kid. Like, like you know, this isn't a thing he's doing for sport or for fun. Um, like, it's what he's doing to feed his family, and he's just so wise about that. And like, like the the respect he has for the animals. I mean, it's just like. Like he's just a fascinating guy. Anuli Tepetluk was his name. He was 16 years old, but he talks as if he's 46. Um, and uh, and he took me to his his house and showed me his freezer that's outside, which is just like full of caribou, you know, haunches, and I mean, just really all parts are just sort of shoved in there. There's no there's no mystery to any of that. <laughs> <laughs> it is right there. Um, and and like yeah, that's that's you know what he does to to help out. His, his mom's a single mom, and so he, he goes out with his uncles and, and he hunts um, and traps. And it's not just caribou, but mostly that's what they do. Um, but yeah, it's fascinating. And and as he pointed out, like a box of bullets costs less than a frozen pizza does um, because the oh, grocery yeah. stores in those small Alaskan towns are crazy expensive. My favorite game. I was there with my cameraman, and we would play like Price Is Right in the grocery store. And I'd be like, <laughs> okay. 12 pack of diet dr pepper what do you think and he'd be like i don't know eight dollars no 22 dollars <laughs> so, um, because which seems crazy until you think about the journey that dr pepper has yeah the, everything has to be imported everything's mm-hmm. imported so and you know people like frozen french fries and pizzas just like anybody else so the community certainly eats that stuff um but uh not only is is the you know the food that they're finding in their backyard healthier it's also much much cheaper um and 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 those villages often are are you know economically fairly disadvantaged and so there's a variety of reasons and also just culture and tradition and everything um for why the, the hunt continues there there's a lot of lessons from that because uh, part national parks uh, which sometimes c- are come under um, different titles in in different parts of the world one of the great criticisms of them is that they were created in a way that very often facilitated the removal of the people who lived there. Like to create the park, we have to move, we have to vacate it from from humans entirely. So the, the, there very rarely has been this sort of integrated approach where they have a place within the landscape, those people who had um, historically lived there. Uh, and I think it shows that that is, that is possible. And also that this idea of uh, sustainable use, uh, sustainable and ethical use of wild resources can be a very important um, and vital part of rural communities. Uh, you know, when you were talking about the freezer there, it's, it, when I have discussions about uh, hunting with you know, different people around the world, and obviously I'm here in LA right now, so most people who I uh, meet are, don't hunt, and I don't necessarily you know, bring it up unless there's a reason to, but the vast majority of meat in, in my freezer is all stuff that I've hunted, and very few people ever have an issue with that whatsoever. It's far less uh, a prickly topic when it's discussed in those terms than I think what most people think of if it's just brought up as a, an overarching um, concept of people hunting. Yeah, it... And then we still got emails of like, oh, gross. Why, how would, how would you, why would you ever show that, you know, butchered caribou mm. or whatever? I mean, there were people, uh, I think that might also just be the fact that we come on 9am on a Sunday morning and, and it's a little, <laughs> maybe a little jarring uh, for what you're seeing, but, but mostly the feedback was very positive. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a balance that continues to exist in the parks and, and I'm, I'm not 
as knowledgeable about it as I should be. But in the lower 48, there's there's still ongoing issues of, of you know, not so much hunting within the park, but like how hunting on the um, on the outskirts of the, on the park periphery. boundaries. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Packs that. Can you like lure animals out of the park? Like what what all happens? And then, um, uh, but, but because Alaska happened later, because those parks for the most part um, weren't established until the eighties. Denali was established before that, but but many of them weren't. We had some chances to learn from our mistakes. So like. Yeah, evicting people from the land that they've occupied for thousands and thousands of years. Like by the 80s, we realized that's kind of messed up, you know, or I mean, it's 100% messed up. Like that, that shouldn't happen. Um, and so they were done much more in cooperation with the folks who live there. And, and at one point I was asking a woman who's in charge of a lot of them in Alaska um, you know, about how uh, low how low the visitation was. And she really made a point to point out, she's like, listen, yeah, it may not be a like highly visited park, but it is a well used park, maybe more than, than most parks, you know, in terms of what that park provides for the people who live near it, it is, it is very well used. It just doesn't get a lot of, of tourists from, from Kansas. So um, there's, there's a distinction there um, for those parks. Whereas, I don't know, like the Everglades is much more of like a, a, vacation destination um and these these are really providing uh, you know food and, and also just like a source of pride and tradition and everything for the people who are there mm. it's interesting because the, the i live right on the edge of a uh, national park in scotland uh called the cairngorms national park the vast majority of the land in the cairngorms national park is privately owned uh, but it falls within the boundaries uh, that they created to be this national park. And it comes with you know, a whole heap of, of benefits, but also restrictions as to what you can do because it's about pr- protecting this natural, um, partially natural landscape because almost all of it is managed in, in some way, shape or form. And people live within this park as they always have done. Uh, it's lar- uh, it, largely speaking, it's very small rural communities, but we we live within it. It's a, it's a very different system to to you have here, uh, to what you have here. But it, it's a lot. There's a lot of similarities with the um, with the Alaskan model because there's also uh, harvest of um, wild creatures through hunting activities on the estates that exist within the park as it is, and and you know that goes into the food chain. Um, so it's uh, Alaska has been so high on my list of places to go, and I nearly had the chance to go there a couple of years ago to go and do a filming job, uh, but it fell through. At the, no, it didn't fall through at last minute, and it was a very last minute uh, job request, and I had a clash that I, as much as I really wanted to cancel the job that I was supposed to be doing to go to Alaska, I couldn't. Um, so I, it's I didn't realize how convenient it was from. I mean, I should have realized, but like from LA just to take a flight up there. So maybe next time I'm on this side of the country, I should carve some time out to head up to Alaska and see some of the parks. Absolutely. I mean, although the flight there will be the easiest part of your journey. Once you're there, you're not going to want to leave. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I spent more than a month there and then I've also been back for another couple of weeks for a different story. Wow. Um, I, I did a story about how Alaska had the last blockbuster videos left in the country. Um, no, it, come yeah, on. Was, I even know. It was Blockbuster, there was like a chain store that you'd go and uh, rent Chain video out. store. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we had the like, same in the UK. Which went bankrupt in 2010. And sure enough, yeah. I think that's right. But like, I drove by one when I was in Anchorage to do stories. And I, I like, I just did a double take and I'm like, what? Like, how? It, the lights were on, there were people inside. It was it. an institution in the day. Yeah. And so I wrote a note to myself. I'm like, find out why that is. And, and those are my favorite types of stories that I get to do for work is like, it's not an article I read in the New York Times that I'm trying to do a TV version of it. This is just a thing that happened in my life where I was like, why the hell is there a blockbuster here? And then a year <laughs> later, I'm back there again, figuring it out. And so um, uh, the, the short version of that is that um, uh, even though block, Blockbuster went bankrupt, a few of the franchise owners had the option to keep theirs. There's this guy in Texas who owned a handful of them in Alaska. He decided uh. to keep them because what killed Blockbuster was Netflix. And yep. the internet is slow and expensive in Alaska. And so ah. it didn't quite kill it there. Alaska has an older population. It's Yet. cold with long winter. So there's a few more reasons why people still wanted to rent DVDs. So these, mm-hmm. these last few were holding on for a while. So anyway, I went back and seeing it in the winter, like if you're going to go once, I'd say go in the summer just because yeah. 
and that is probably when it's at its best. You get to see the, the you know the brown bears and everything. But winter was was really interesting too. My, my new Alaska bucket list is uh, Northern Lights. I tried to see that during that trip and then got cloudy oh, yeah. out, so I, I didn't have a chance. Have you seen uh, them anywhere? Never have. No, uh-uh. I've thought about it in. Uh-huh. I mean, Iceland seems like a doable place to maybe yep. get that done, but I haven't been there during the right time of the year. So, yeah, have you ever seen them? Yeah, I've seen them quite a few times. Uh, which it's, we we see them in Scotland, uh, particularly mm-hmm. in North Scotland. Not as vivid. Well, it's very rare they're as vivid as as further north. Uh, but I've been lucky to see them both in Norway and Sweden when I've been working there, uh, and in Svalbard actually, um, which is another really great location to see them. And that it's. Yeah, there's. I I don't have the vocabulary to describe how magical they are. Yeah, see, that's what I. That, that's that's you've sold me on it even more because it, it seems like an indescribable type of experience. I've seen some pictures, but I, I've got to imagine that this is. Uh, it's different to stand underneath them. So hopefully, oh yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. It's it's so ethereal. And we were actually when we flew out of Svalbard. Um, this was two years ago, I think. The northern lights were showing through the through the window of the plane because we flew out at night. So I got to oh, see them wow. in the sky. Wow! While I was in the sky, is where the, which the was seed bank is, amazing. right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, which okay. flooded a few years ago, huh? or some of it flooded a few years ago. Yeah, one of it's one of the. I mean, this happens a lot on our show, but in particular. Uh, the story that was done on the the seed bank. I was very jealous of my colleague who did that. So he got to go there. Oh, yeah. and, and I was like, ah, oh, Seth, dang it. Like, I should have pitched that. That could have been me. I mean, he did a great job with it. But that, that, that happens a lot where you see someone else's piece. And you're like, ah, oh, I, I didn't get it because they were still fixing it from the flood. I didn't get a chance to visit it uh, when I was there, sadly. But as a, as a destination, uh, this sort of like you were talking about with Alaska, the sort of frontier of discovery, the, the, that little bit that's inside, I think, everyone. It truly is one of those places. You're so far above the Arctic Circle, and it's got the highest density of polar bears in the world. Um, you go at the right time of year, and you're going to see walrus. And there's a subspecies of um, reindeer that they find you find on mainland um, uh, Scandinavia, which is very similar to your caribou. It's a really, really magical place. Uh, and we took... Uh, snow bikes for a couple of days we did like 300 kilometers on snow bikes visiting different places um, around the island it's if if you have the opportunity to go there put out everything else that's in your way aside so that you can all right done done and that frontier by the way exists even to like the anchorage airport which like as soon as you get off the plane you just sort of look maybe maybe i was wanting to see this but everyone felt like a little wilder than you might see it. <laughs> where like you just see all these like guys with big beards, and you're like, like, there's just some look where it's like, oh, you probably killed a guy in Tampa. <laughs> like, <laughs> now, you, now you live in Alaska. <laughs> like, because like there's a lot of like like very. Extreme- I think there's some truth to that. <laughs> yeah, like because you you're going there for like this is a massive generalization, but like like you often something has happened to send you there, whether you're going to yeah. be an ice road trucker or these extreme kind of jobs that you see on, on discovery channel, they've made an entire series out of just like the weird, yeah. uh, uh, you know, high salary, high risk jobs that might take you to Alaska, or it's it just seems like a far away place it's where Jesse wants to go in breaking bad. You know, it just sounds like I got to get out of yeah. Alaska. You know, it seems got to escape. Yeah. You've got to escape. But so you find some folks like that. So even like a school teacher probably has an interesting story. Um, there was a, a woman I met who was a, a, a cafeteria worker um, and she'd like, you know, been working in Georgia her whole life. And she was just, she'd had enough. And then like looked at a map and saw some job posting in Alaska and decided, all right, I want to reset. I'm going to move there. So I think uh, Hawaii, you find a similar type of person there. Um, not so much the like construction lumberjack kind of guy. Um, but the folks who were just like, all right, I need a massive shift in my life. What am I going to do? Let's do Hawaii or Alaska. So they they both attract a lot of those uh, types of folks. I, I've certainly had periods where escaping to a place like that has seemed like the most awesome thing that I could possibly do. No, I get it. And I mean, Anchorage is a good mix where like it gives you access to a lot of those you know, pretty spots, but it's still a, a major city. So the thing I I think I would struggle with 
because I found this in Montana. I, I love Montana. It's, a, it's an incredible state. And I have some friends there and I spend a bit of time there. And when I first went there, I was like, this is probably one of the first places I've ever been that I could probably trade Scotland for. But mm. the winter is so long and so yeah. hard. I, I don't know whether I'm tough enough to take that. And yeah, Alaska would be even worse. It's, uh, I think that would, that would ultimately be why I couldn't live there. And honestly, even parts of the summer, as beautiful it is, as it is, um, they say that the, the state bird of, of Alaska is the mosquito um, because there are <laughs> months where it's just so... That as well, and, yeah. Yeah, and I, unfortunately, I kind of missed that window of time, but I think even when the sun's out, it can be a little strange. And really, the, the 24-hour sun, um, I didn't get used to it while I was there. Maybe if you live there, you, you fall into a more normal sleep cycle, but I can see that mm. being pretty disruptive, too, if you, if you up and move there. Yeah, well, we don't have quite at home. We don't have quite have twenty four hours of sun, but in the in the summer, it's only getting dark at like half past ten, and the sun's coming back up again at two. And close your curtains, you soon you soon find a way to get into a normal kind of sleep pattern. It was one other thing that I was I really wanted to make sure I covered um, before we bring our chat to a close, and that was this. We see this a lot at home as well with destinations of extreme natural beauty where there's this real challenge to balance encouraging people to come to a place and halting the number of people who go there because of them potentially damaging that landscape and the very reason that they're going there in the first place. Some of the the really well-known uh, national parks in North America must suffer from that as well, I'm guessing. Did you see that? Very much so, yeah. In particular, uh, the parks in Utah really struggle with that. Zion is, is maybe the best example. Um, that was one of the very first national parks I ever went to. When I was 14, I took a trip with my family uh, out west, and it's the first time I'd ever been on an airplane, and, and just this, I saw the scenery that, that blew my mind. Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, went to the Grand Canyon, um, very different than the, the hills of West Virginia that I grew up with. But and I'm going to forget exactly the percentage, but like the massive, like quadrupling of visitation or whatever it's been since that period of time. I mean, every year Zion's uh, charting a new record in terms of, of people. And if you were a business, that'd be fantastic news. Um, and you'd also probably raise your prices. Um, but that's not how the parks work for, for good reason. And so they, when I went, you could drive anywhere um, in the park. Maybe a few years after my family and I took that trip, they instituted a shuttle system um, because the crowds were already starting to get too intense. And so from then on, you could not drive for most of the year. You couldn't drive a private car into the park. You had to board these buses and they would let you off at different trailheads. Um, that actually creates sort of different issues because all of a sudden you're letting 50 people off all at once um, instead of slowly having these pulses of visitors um, head out on a trail. But even that shuttle system now has like an hour and a half wait um, there are safety issues. Angels Landing is one of the most popular trails in the park. Um, I would not recommend someone do that trail right now, um, just because it's so crowded and legit dangerous. I mean, many people have died on it. It's not physically that hard, but all it takes is one person trying to take the selfie at the wrong time or wearing flip flops when they shouldn't be, or a little kid who's run away from their parents, like to send a, a whole group falling off the edge. And so I find that trail unsafe because of the crowds now. And then, as you mentioned, there's the resource um, issue where people are creating social trails. They're, they're walking off the intended path. That's causing erosion where there shouldn't be. Uh, it's it's um, Zion has, is, and I wouldn't be surprised within the next year if they've come out with some new guidelines on this. They're considering a permitted, like timed entry uh, program. And, while it feels very un-American, very un-national park to be told when and when you can't go, I think a lot of the beauty of them is that you can just show up at any point in the day, at any time you want. It might be crowded, but at least it's there waiting for you. Here, it might be how they run some of the more popular museums in Washington, D.C. It's how they run the Getty Villa here in L.A., where it's like you have a slot. It's still free, but it's like, okay, it's Wednesday at 3 p.m. And that's when you're allowed in. Um, and it's this balance of like what's better, having it. You know, 10,000 people having a terrible time and, or 8,000 people having a good time. Um, 
And so, yeah, they're, they're struggling with that. A lot of these gateway communities, Moab, Utah, which is near Arches and Canyonlands National Park, are kind of overrun with folks. Um, and, you know, that creates a, a variety of stresses on, on those towns. So it's, it's interesting. However, that's the story of the minority of parks. So the vast majority of parks still have plenty of room to roam. It's, it's something where, like, like the, most of the visitation happens in a very small fraction of them. But those that get that visitation um, are, are really taxed. A lot of it's international visitors, actually, right now, too. As air travel's gotten easier, the parks have gotten more popular. You know, they're seeing massive tour buses come through from, from all across the world and you know, trying to find that balance. So um, I think Zion will be the one to watch to figure out how they do it. Um, they've raised prices some, but you're, you, you just can't do that too much. You don't want to price people out of the park. Um, so, yeah, it's a really, it's a really hard balance because we spend so much time encouraging people to enjoy and appreciate the natural world. And it's this, the more we do that and the more successful uh, society is at embracing that, the more challenges we face. Yeah. I mean, heck, I'm part of that uh, problem. I'm I'm doing (laughs) 6 million people watch CBS Sunday morning. And for a year, every couple of weeks, I'm like, hey, check out this place. And for sure, (laughs) we're booking trips because of those segments. Um, Yeah. Like, and, and I'm, on one hand, thrilled that like that might have inspired someone to go to a park who wouldn't have considered it otherwise. But the flip side of that is like, yeah, what what are you what are you doing to the parks? Um, mm. I, I think it's only a problem if there isn't an efficient way of harnessing the benefit that people have gained from it and and put, being able to put that benefit back into conserving the parks. There are some places on the west coast of Scotland which have been incredibly damaged in the last decade by the increased footfall of, of tourists, much of whom are, are foreign tourists, which, like you said, is amazing for the local businesses because they're able to make a lot of money. What it isn't amazing for is the natural environment because, in some cases, it's quite literally trampled. And in those circumstances, in many instances, they don't have an efficient way to extract resources from those those people in an appropriate way so that they can put it back into those environments to protect them. And I think that's where the the problem really lies. Yes. I mean, some of it's subtle and it it may be, it's kind of impossible to track, but like Great Basin National Park in Nevada, it's got some of the darkest skies in the country. Um, The experience I had, and I met many people there who were having the same experiences, you're seeing stars that you have never seen in your life. You know, you're having a view of the Milky Way that is just inaccessible to most of the country right now. And I was watching this 14 year old, uh, like Boy Scout troop, like their minds were blown. And they live someplace in New Mexico, maybe Santa Fe, where, where compared to LA, that's a dark sky, but still way brighter than what they were seeing there. And like, they're all determined to go home and like fix the lights on their garage. And like, amazing. Ask their city council to like, you know, install lower wattage or or LED bulbs. There are hoods on their lights. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's like a very like, like concrete um, sort of, you know, takeaway from the park. It's just hard to measure what, how's that impact happening? I think the bigger reason for us is that like the parks are so underfunded, Um, from Congress that like the more support that they have, and that often comes from the more people who visit them, um, like then that, that helps political will, I guess, you know, if you try to defund the the Grand Canyon, well, you're going to have millions, you know, a five or so million people a year who are going to say, wait a minute, don't do that. I went there. I love that place. Um, And so that's the the other upside of, of increased visitation is at least you have more people who are on the side of the parks. Um, that said, and that's voting not, power. Yeah, it's not representative of the country, unfortunately. Though that, that's the last thing I'll say is that like it's it's uh, it's way too white. And so I think as the parks look to what the next hundred years are going to be like, um, as the population becomes more and more diverse, it's making sure the people who go and experience the parks and have access feel welcome. To exactly feel welcome because otherwise why would you vote to keep this thing if all of a sudden it's like well yeah who cares if this gets money i've never been to one my family's never been to one i felt weird the one time i went to one like Mm -hmm. then that's not going to to help so it's it's sort of making sure that that um even just for a survival reason above let alone the the moral reason um you know more people having access to the parks is is better for their existence for something which to me feels like a, an American institution, the national parks, it, it seems incredible that they would struggle for funding. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's it's something like a twelve billion dollar backlog. I think is where they're at right now. So Ugh. you know, the the biggest challenge, and, and you know, it, there's there's been a, every park has had a fight. This is a you know has gone on for more than a century. Um, was protecting them. You know, and in a way, thank goodness there's no like gold at Yellowstone that people knew about because it probably would be a park. You know, like so you yeah. know, the, like they were a lot of them were set aside because, and you can even find this back in like the debates that they had in Congress because they were perceived as quote worthless. Um, and you know, now people see the value in that scenery. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of competing every year. There's no park that would tell you they have enough to do what they want. Um, but this is beyond just like, oh, we could have some cool new like salamander programs at the visitor center. This is like like roads, trails, bathrooms, like it's it's getting bad. And this is kind of the story of a lot of like highway infrastructure across the US as well. But like the parks in particular are, are hurting. And um, I don't know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that a lot of money, not so much for the parks, but for wildlands in general come from hunters um, and, and different taxes on that. I think, I think, I, I would not be surprised if one a solution I've seen talked about, I don't know if this will ever happen, is like like that same type of tax happening on granola bars or or yeah, backpacks. Yeah, backpack or tax. yeah. Yeah. Um so uh it's being floated in I think I can't I think in Wyoming hmm. there is some fairly deep dis- I might be wrong on the state there. Uh I will have to speak to my friend Jess and find out if I'm right, because I'm sure it was her that told me about it, who's been on the podcast before. Uh, but I think they're in fairly deep discussions on ha- implementing a backpack tax, because like you say, there, there's a very, and there has been for, well, I mean, almost a hundred years, a very structured approach to extracting funds from hunters, which doesn't just, I mean, it, it goes, it's used for all manner of things from, from, from national parks to conservation research, to, um, f- f- funding different scientists, uh, looking at species which are, are not even huntable species. Uh, but there is uh, a notion that there are a lot of people who gain, and this kind of goes back to what we were just talking about 15 minutes ago, they gain a lot of benefit from using these places. But not that it's their fault, but there is no mechanism for them to put back into that landscape. Uh, it's like we, we talk about this at home uh, a little bit with our rivers. There is sometimes conflict between fishermen who are paying to be on a river and they're paying for the management of that system, you know, whether that be clearing felled trees um, or it be repopulating the, the upper reaches uh, with salmon fry because of various industrial processes in the past that have decimated that river system. They're funding that through essentially a tax system for, for fishing for migratory fish. Whereas the canoeist who uses that river has no mechanism for paying into that system, even though they are enjoying it too. Um, so yeah, I think that is something that needs to be discussed more. Uh, we, uh, we need to find, and it is not laying blame on anyone because those mechanisms do not exist as it stands right now for people to be able to uh, buy, like to pay in other than giving money to uh, some sort of charitable organization that does good work. Yeah. And that's, uh, and who, who's like lobbying for them? You know, that's, that's the challenge too, is that like, like, you know, if, if everyone loves the parks, but like the, uh, I guess sometimes, sometimes it's community, sometimes it's gateway communities who would lobby for, for more funding for them. Cause it does help, you know, provide jobs and, and you know, restaurant meals and all kinds of stuff in, in that town, but it, it's tough. I don't know. It, it's not a new problem. They've been underfunded for forever, really. Um, it's just that like, the compounding effect of so much work that needs to be done um, uh, is, is, is really, you know, uh, starting to make a, 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 I'm seeing more articles about it now. I, I think it, like, it's just things that were built 50 years ago have started to crumble and they need to fix yep. it. You know? Yeah. Are there any big sort of conservation wins from the national park system that stick out in your mind that, that you came across? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly. The, Apart from bison, I mean, bison's obviously the the big one that's on the on most people's mind when they think of national parks, Yellowstone, bison. Well, then I'll give you the littlest one as a contrast. Okay, um, cool. Uh, the Devil's Hole pupfish is, I believe, it's one of the. What on earth is that? <laughs> yes, so it is one inch long. It lives. If you were ever to look at a map of Death Valley National Park, there it's you know three million acres, mostly in California and Nevada. Um, 
And then there's this little 40 acre parcel that's like completely separate from the rest of the park. It looks like it's just like a little green, a green speck that got dropped on the map. That is to protect Devil's Hole, which is this, uh, it looks basically just like a puddle, um, maybe, I don't know, 10 feet across, um, uh, which is the only known habitat of the Devil's Hole pupfish. At one point, Death Valley was all, I mean, now it's the driest place and the hottest place in the country. It was once all covered with water. When that water all dried up, you know, these fish, these pupfish kind of landed in certain little pockets around the, the park. Um, this, the Devil's Hole pupfish, it's, a, it's an aquifer, so it goes down deceptively deep, actually to a depth that nobody knows. Um, uh, some people have tried to dive down to the bottom. They've, they've never seen it. Um, but that's where these fish live. And so, um, the park, it's, it's partially why we have the endangered species act. Um, there were some alfalfa ranchers near the park who had realized that like, Hey, if there's water underneath this little hole, there's probably water under our land. They tried to, you know, they dug wells, turns out there was, as they're extracting the water, it lowers the water for the pupfish, pupfish start to die. I mean, it's this fascinating story of like, like saving something that's not cute, like which is extremely controversial then and now. I mean, there's still people in that community who like have killed the pupfish bumper stickers. Like the whole thing is covered with a barbed wire fence and like cameras because all it would take are a couple of drops of bleach to kill every pupfish in the world. Wow. Um, but because it's cost millions of dollars to protect these things. Um, <laughs> and like, like the bison is on the symbol of the Department of Interior. Like it's our national mammal. Who's ever even yeah. heard of these pupfish? But like the scientist I talked to, to there who's like you know he spent his life studying them it is like it's kind of the beauty of of conservation is that it's not just these things that are delicious or cute or fun to hunt or whatever it's like an all or nothing kind of approach and so um conserving these pupfish um which uh you know were were it was human caused actions that were causing them to die um uh, is is just as much of a success story. Um, don't go looking for these things. Do, do not plan a Death Valley trip to go find these pupfish. Like it, <laughs> it's, it's very unsatisfying. Everyone was packing Maybe their cars right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Do not do it. It's <laughs> like you cannot. Like we were allowed special access to go down to, to, to where this uh, to where the water level is and see them, but like from above you can't see anything. Um, uh, there's like, I don't know, a hundred some left in the world and they just all kind of hang out in this one little area. But it, it, to me, it was a fascinating story of like, like, of, uh, of really acting not in our self-interest. Like, I mean, maybe the pupfish contained the cure to, to COVID-19. We don't know. <laughs> but like, <laughs> like it's one day, maybe we will find like a, a reason. But, but the reason right now is good enough that like, you know, we should conserve as many species as possible. Um, the biggest win that happened during my year was the Channel Island Fox. So that's actually not far from LA at all. That's at Channel Island okay. National Park, which is like an hour boat ride um, uh, from Southern California. Um, that was a, a very rare delisting of an endangered species. Um, things get added to the list all the time. And very rarely do they mm -hmm. get taken off. And the yep. Channel Island Fox was the fastest delisting in history, I believe, of a mammal on the list. Um, and just an interesting story about how everything's connected in nature. Those foxes, which had lived on those islands for thousands of years, um, started to mysteriously die off. And they eventually traced it back to the fact that the bald eagle, which had mostly been killed off by DDT, the pesticide, they used to yeah. live on the islands. When the bald eagles left, the golden eagle swooped in. Um, and whereas the bald eagle mostly eats fish, the golden eagle mostly eats foxes. Hammering the foxes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so like, it was just this fox buffet for the golden eagle. So you can't blame them. I mean, they were just doing what they do. But like, it was like, there's that John Muir quote that like, you know, you, and I'm paraphrasing, but like, you know, you, you tug at any one thing in, in the universe and you find it's connected to everything else. Like that's, that's a yep. perfect example of that because like some poison that was killing these bald eagles is why ultimately these foxes were disappearing on this island. And so it got down to like crisis mode for the foxes, but they, they took them all off, bred them and, and put them back. Um, and so, so now it's, you know, very easy to spot. So then that's a park, by the way, next time you're in LA, like it took me a decade to go. I can't believe it took seeing every national park in the country to see the one that had been the closest to my <laughs> for so long. But like, it's so close. And I think just because there is some ocean separating it, it feels uh, farther, but um, you know, book a boat tour and get out there in an afternoon. So 
I'll have to I'll have to do that next time. It was maybe something I could have done this time if I wasn't confined to barracks. Yeah, right. Yeah, those boats are definitely <laughs> shut down right now. That was my first thought is when this all happened. It's like, all right, I got to get out and see a park, and then very quickly they, you know, they're pretty much all shut down right now. So I'll 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 try and go with uh, my friend and, uh, and and naturalist Jason Goldman because I'm sure he'll be able to fill my brains with all manner of interesting facts. Yeah, yeah. So you want you want a, a fox fact person uh, going out there with you? Yeah, because uh, they're yeah. they're different types of them there's like the santa cruz island fox and the such and such fox and and they're cute um so that that is one where like if they're not on a postage stamp they will be soon i mean that it's it's very easy to make a case for why we should save these foxes uh <laughs> less so for the devil's hole pup fish yeah w- which, which is small wet and slimy and cold yeah exactly <laughs> yeah connor it's been a an amazing conversation with you i'm th- I'm going to have to ask one request and there's the next time I'm here I need to get a signed copy of your book because the one that I'm reading right now is not mine and I have to leave it ah, here. Right. <laughs> um but it's really a fascinating approach to talking about national parks in North America because it's not it's not a deep dive into the history. I find found it so or I'm finding it because I'm not quite done yet with the, with the book but I'm finding it so much more personable and almost relatable. And I think that that's going to endear a lot of people to it. Oh, good. Well, thank you. That's that's very nice to hear. I appreciate it. So, yes, I will definitely, once we're allowed to be within six feet of each other, I, I will make sure to bust out the Sharpie <laughs> and give you a side copy. Absolutely. Well, tell me, uh, where, can, where, where can people find it and where can people find you? Uh, so the book, um, really anywhere uh, books are sold online, which, uh, I mean, depending on when you're listening to this, but right now, chances are uh, the, the physical bookstore is closed. Um, but... Uh, online anywhere from you know the big Barnes and Noble books a million Amazon kind of sites um, uh, or your local bookstore probably has a website bookshop.org is the one that I've been pushing people towards recently because they have partnerships with a lot of small local shops and they could all use your support right now and then if you want to find me it's just uh, Connor Knighton C-O-N-O-R K-N-I-G-H-T-O-N on Twitter on Instagram uh, and then ConnorKnighton.com. I'm on all those spots. So I post pic. I, you know what? Somewhere on one of those, there's there's a picture of one of those fish. So if you're in, if you're in the rare, <laughs> I was fish just going to say I'm. I was going to look it up and 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 post it for people on social <laughs> just after yeah. this podcast because I'm fascinated. <laughs> It's it's on there. Cool. It's on there. Well, I think that's one of the few I didn't take. I think I had to rely on like a government photo of that fish because I couldn't even capture it. But uh, I think I might have my <laughs> own fox photo on there. So. <laughs> Connor, thanks so much. And hopefully next time I'm in town, I can, uh, if you're not traveling somewhere in uh, your nomadic lifestyle, maybe we can meet in person. I love that. I mean, what's what's crazy is that honestly, it may be more likely to happen in Scotland than here. So we'll see. I'll, I'll vice versa. Well, I'll you're, you're more than welcome. I can, there, I, can, so. I can point you in the right direction Perfect. for some of the cool places to go. No, that sounds great. Um, yeah, well, great talking to you. Thank you so much. That's it for now. Join me in a week's time where we bring the next installment of Behind the Lens. And in two weeks' time from now, we'll be taking another walk into the wilderness with a long-form interview and Ryan Youngblood. 